Now we come into the next increment, which is about the Huios Anaphora. I am building up to something that's going to blow your mind away, but I have to at least show you the parts first. That's the boring, you know. Well, I don't know what this leads up to. Well, you're going to find out, hopefully soon. Okay, Huios means sun, just like Kurios means lord, and Blepo means sea. And that's a sort of preview of coming attractions. This is like, um, Russian nested dolls. Alright, the outermost, earliest reference in an anaphora, other than Blepo, the subject is Kurias, and that's in verse 20. And then, in between, in verses 21 and 23 and 29, we have Blepo. So, if you translated it, this would be God. This would be to see, so we say God sees, and then Huyas. God sees the sun, like little Russian nested dolls. And how can we say that? Because that's verse 20, and this is 21, 23, and 29, and we are using all three of those because the Kurios, the last time Kurios is used, is in 35. In between, which is a the topic of this video is 26 and 32 so technically it would be 20 21 23 26 29 32 and 35 in other words we got little nested anaphora that are all like got their last prior connection point outside the inner doll like little Russian nested dolls so that the innermost part okay would have to be this last reference so it would be from 26 to 29 to 32 to 35 you see that that way all three of them are nested together and you say, well, where are you getting that from? Well, I'm getting it from Paul, because this is what Paul did. And Paul, when you, when you look for the nest like this, and you find the innermost part, which would be 26, 29, 32, and 35, then you're getting the historical period that is being prophesied as most important. Now, just throwing a lot at you, so I'll let you sit for a minute and look at this. If you hear sound in the background, it's my heater. Okay. Twenty. Well, before I even get there, let me show you the Huyas. The Huyas is just two bookends at 26. Whoops. Wrong. I'm going to my own note. Oh, boy. Go here. Go to Huyas. It's 26, which is right here in the top window. See, Opsonte ton huion tuan tropu. Alright? And translating it. And then they will see the Son of Man. But this is not just any old Son of Man. There is no. How do you want to call it? In the Old Testament, there are a lot of phrases called the Son of Man, but they're all mistranslated. They should say Son of Adam. The only place it's not mistranslated is in Daniel 7.13. And in Greek, there's no mistaking what this is. In translation, everybody mistakes it. says, oh, it doesn't mean anything special. Oh, yes, it does. He's claiming he's God. The very title, Son of Man, is a claim of being the Ancient of Days, which is specifically identified as God taking on humanity and taking a seat. Only humanity sits. 
Now, I'm sorry that the Bible decides to be, that God decided to make the Bible so clever that you actually have to think about the words when you hear them. But, you see why that's used now and why it's important? So that's our first Huyas reference, and I'll let you look at this. I, I'm not going to go through the history now, because you can just click on these links. I provided some quick links, sometimes to Wiki, but my more favorite, um, when I can get it, is at the DIR site. But you can click on the links while, you know, you, hopefully you've downloaded this already. You can click on the links and look at this while I take off for a second. Okay. So now. And then they will see the Son of Man as in Daniel 7.13, the Ancient of Days, who's God-man, by definition in Daniel 7.13. Coming with, it says the end means in, with, in association with, by means of, the clouds. Okay? You'll notice that that's the seventy, and it makes sense that it would seven. Okay, I mean, that, that clause can stand completely on its own. It's very poetic. It's very dramatic. And it's talking about him. It's talking about the end of time. This is 940 A.D., and I do not know why 940 A.D. is so important in Byzantine history. I have to, I have to go look it up. All right? That's dramatic language. So whatever this d time period is depicting is going to be seen as if. Deus Ex Machina. A Savior is coming down out of the clouds. But it's also referring, of course, to the real second advent. Alright. But it's using the word huias right here. That's the first instance. The second instance is all the way down here at verse 35. Is it 34? 32. 32. 32. See, the very last clause. Huias. All right. So if I go down to the 30, 32's note, which is right here, 32, 32, here we go, and book ending. Okay. That tells you what time that is. Now, you can read the history again yourself. This is Manuel 1. And then the earlier one is still in the reign of this guy. Oops. This guy. Constantine the Seventh, who was still in his minority at that time. And his so-called head, because there was a whole slew of them, head regent, Romanos, one, La Capenos. Okay, he was a kind of outsider. He married the Empress, the Porfirogenitas. He married her and then became Emperor as a result. She didn't want to mess with the day-to-day -day affairs of ruling, so he did the ruling. point of the 26 here 940 he's still alive he's got four more years left to go actually he doesn't know that he's gonna die four years after that and he was in the process of sort of consolidating the Empire but he had this problem um, by 940 especially problem that he had was his sons didn't like him. <laughs> and, and see, this guy is old enough to be on the throne and this guy basically said, No, you're not you're not old enough, I'm gonna be your regent. That's kinda what David did to Solomon, sparked a civil war. If you go read the story about it. 
Um, it's in First Kings chapter one through five, all the way to the end of five. And because it sparked a civil war, David got up out of his near death bed because he was being sneaky with God at the time. He got up out of his near death bed and had Solomon crowned a second time in that end of this what would have been a civil war. That's kind of what's going on here, except that this guy, Romanus, gets a conscience and decides, you know what, I've been sort of keeping Constantine the Seventh from ruling. I shouldn't do that. And the minute he started having a conscience, his sons rebelled against him. Okay? So maybe it's marking 940 because that's when the rebellion effectively started. It took them four years. They end up ousting their own father aided by Constantine the seventh wife who was the daughter of this guy so the daughter and the sons well I mean it kinda goes both ways the daughter helps want to get her father out because she wants Constantine the seventh rule because of course that makes her empress and her brothers want Romanus out because they want to be emperors instead so ridiculous the story why don't people just learn Bible and not work I mean what do you gain by being in power like this I've never understood that anyway so the boys and her she sort of conspiring for a very different reason conspired to get Romanos out and their way of doing it in the Byzantine Empire was to get you discredited first and then sometimes yes, sometimes no, they blind you, they put out your eyes, literally. And then they make you a monk. The, the monasteries were staffed with all kinds of discredited people. They wouldn't kill you. You stayed alive and then they stuck you in a monastery. They tonsured you, which means they, they did a thing on your head, cutting your hair a certain way. And then, then they made you a, a monk. And then you died in the monastery. So monasteries were essentially prisons, all right, full of political prisoners in those days. You see why God didn't, doesn't have a particularly good opinion of the Byzantine Empire. All right, so as soon as the boys managed to get daddy discredited and made into a monk, she was working behind the scenes to get her husband replacing. And that's what ends up happening by 944. This is the turning point in 940. So I guess I do know why it's done like that. So that seemed like coming in the clouds. It's, it's, it's a satire. Hopefully you can see that. Oh, my! finally my husband is going to rule. And we're going to get rid of those stupid sons. This is like the story of, 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 what's his name? What's his name? The Tempest? Was it the Tempest? Or, you know, the guy who had three daughters and... One of them was faithful to him, and the others were rebellious. And and I forget I forget the name of that play. Oh, it's a Shakespearean play. Ian McKellen played the lead guy. And and I can't remember the name of the play now. It's not The Tempest, though. King Lear. That's who it was. The play's name is King Lear. Thank you, Dad. I have a very bad personal memory. <laughs> okay, so Romanus gets ousted, and Constantine wins the day, coming on his white horse with the clouds. Clouds always mean people. Okay. Coming on the clouds to save the day, deus ex machina at the end of the play. Oh, 940, that's when the changeover occurs. Okay. And that's how they build it, because the whole thing about being an oriental, oriental rule is it's always over the top. It's like Donald Trump's apartment. It's just ugly and gaudy and over the top and all this pomp and circumstance. You know, every culture has something in it, some things in it that are kind of yucky. That's what's yucky about Byzantine culture. So... God, before knowing all this, reserves these words for this time. So 
so that when the Byzantines come to this time and they hear all the cheering out about, oh, our Savior is finally saving the country from Romanus, they'll think, oh, that was satirized by the Bible, wasn't it? Look at that. Yeah, that's kind of like Matthew 25, 11, which is our time, our years. Lord, Lord! Yeah, that's 2015 to 2018. 2015, 16, 17, 18, yeah. It's, this is analogous to that. Only it's back in 940. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay? Now, that long-winded explanation is designed to show you that, hi, look at this clause. It's sevens at the end. It's got hui on it. What about the what about the ending reference in verse thirty two right here? Oh well that's not seventy. Well, it depends on which kind of sevening is being stressed. The clause before it is seventy. And it's very cleverly sevening too because Matthew twenty four won't seven this way. No, I didn't show it. But the Matthew twenty four passage only goes to 11.10 and it's been driving me crazy because it should be 11.13 like this is but Matthew's making a point about time being out of sync due, due to the Crusades okay but the Byzantines weren't involved in the Crusades I mean a little bit but not very much they, you know I said oh fine let the Latins have it I mean they were actually in charge of the area of the Crusades at the time but they didn't care they really didn't. They just evacuated. And the Arabs took over and then they make some kind of peace and a trade deal. And then they end up coming back to Jerusalem. Okay? Nobody cared about the Jews and the Byzantines were very anti-Semitic. So if the Muslims came in and they decided to destroy a bunch of Jews, fine. Then we'll just leave and we'll wait till they do that and we'll come back. Okay? I mean, there were always exceptions. But they had control over the area when this happened. And that's the crusade. That's 1143. That's just before the second crusade. Alright? And it's not like they never went or they didn't do anything about it. But it's like, it's already ours. We'll come back and get it later. Whereas the Latins were like, Oh, we have to defend the cause of Christ. Well, actually, no, they were just defending their egos. Both sides were wrong. So the Arabs came in and plucked it. God's saying, hi, get out of Dodge. I told you to get out of Dodge. This whole thing has been about get out of Dodge ever since. Ever since, way up here. Way up here, remember, it says, right here, up here. Where was it? Where was it? Where was it? Oh, well, you know, birth planes. Don't worry about what you're going to say because you're going to be under the Holy Spirit. You're going to be delivered over. Okay. When you see the abomination, what are you supposed to do? Get out of Dodge. Run to the mountain. And when was that? Oh. That's 523 plus 30 equals 553. Way before there were Arabs who were, existed as Muslims. This was way before Islam. Alright? So when you see the abomination, and what abomination was it? Well, this particular one, because it's been benchmarked in the other, two, the other two versions of the same prophecy in Matthew 24 and uh, Luke 21, this guy, this time he's stressing Justinian the first and his successors because they're building a temple atop the Holy of Holies that depicts Christ. They're building a temple to Mary. They call it the Nea. Nea. You can, just, you can Google on this. Nea Teotakas. They're building a temple to Mary atop the Holy of Holies. Does it get more abominating than that? Okay? So yeah, once you see them start building, and actually the building started in 527, but they didn't have the money, so they stopped. Then Justinian comes in in 527 AD, and he starts the rebuilding off and on again. 
when you see that happening and you got plenty of time to get out because they're going to stop and start and stop and start and stop and start when you see the abomination that desolates you know like bread is moldy and it's you look at the mold and it's like oh can't do anything with this just throw it out the bread is desolated oh then get out of Dodge way here before there are Muslims and it's not due to the Muslims that it's an abomination it's due to Christians so now we come back down here again 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 and now it's 9.40 and that the ruins of that abomination have been taken away you know what's sitting up there now the same dome of the rock you see on nightly news that shows Jerusalem you can't even see a picture of Jerusalem on the nightly news without it showing the dome of the rock that's where the holy of holies is in case anybody forgets alright so the sun, 9-10. We know what that is. I just covered that. So then we come back down here. And here's the second reference to the sun, the other bookend, ending at 11.33. But what if I just stopped it here? So then I'd be measuring from this bookend, which includes all of the first one. See, because it's including we us there all the way down all the way down to just before the second one starts that's obviously divisible by seven because the end point is one 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 three crusades between the first and the second and nobody doing anything about the arabs between because they don't care minus nine ten 203, and you know what that is. This is such a killer. This 203, I hope you're sitting down. This is the famous meter in Isaiah 53, at Isaiah 53, 4, the end of the verse. At Isaiah 53, 4, at the end of the verse, it's 203 syllables. Daniel uses that in Daniel 9's prayer. The actual text of that clause at the end of Isaiah 53 says God violated and if you counted your syllables from Isaiah the way I'd show you in the Isaiah 53 videos that is 586 BC do you see how clever Marcus he's tying the second crusade, the advent between the crusades to temple going down the first time in the same area where the temple is that is also the focus of the Arabs and the Christians and the Jews at the time that this 1113 occurs held by ostensibly Byzantium because it was sometimes Byzantium was in control of Jerusalem and, and at this point you have the, the Latin kings of Jerusalem there also you know Baldwin the first um, that guy what's his name the really famous one Richard the Lionhearted will be coming in or as there you know this was the heyday it was just after the first crusade it ended and before the second one starts okay so all the famous people that are the Latins are there too and this is after the great schism between the East and the West so now you have the Western popes who want desperately to control Jerusalem because the East has it that's why you know this is the East alright and the difference is 203 which means temple down and who's the temple at this point? There's no physical temple. Why? Because the second temple, the temple of the body of Christ, is being created. And right now, the temple of the body of Christ is so busy with their stupid relics and they're fighting amongst each other and everybody hates the Jews. The temple is down and the difference between 940 when Romanus goes down I want you to see the historical play here. 
Romanus goes down in 940. I just, I just explained that. By his own kids. Okay, that's like civil war. Okay, so Christ, Christians are in civil war. Over who gets to control Jerusalem. And so, the distance of the two parallel civil wars is 203. To remind everybody, hello, did you count your syllables? Isaiah 53 is the most one of the most famous passages in the Old Testament. Everybody knew it. And Daniel used 203 in his own prayer to tag Isaiah 53, 4. So that mechanism of metrical tagging, which is all over the Bible, I just don't have time to show it all, is being is a reminder to the reader who, when they got Mark's Gospel, they would know that. Because 203 was famous. They would know. But by 113313, nobody knows what it is. Because we're all going to fight over the relics. I'm Santiago de Compostela, and I really have St. James's finger. Just one finger. And a sane person would say, first of all, how can you be sure it's St. James? And secondly, why would you want his finger? Why wouldn't you want his understanding? Oh, no, we just want relics. So that's why they wanted to invade Jerusalem. So they grab a scrap of cloth and call it the Shroud of Turin. And then collect a lot of money by the stupid peasants who line up so they could look at the cloth. Oh, that was the cloth Jesus was buried in. Yeah, that's all the Bible they knew. It was a racket. It was a way to make money. Nobody was bothering teaching the true treasure of the Word of God, which the Greeks had in abundance. If you were to number all the copies of the manuscripts that we have from the old days, the Byzantine period, you know, from like Constantine forward, is like four times as many. If, if, if it may be even more more than that. Because what is so called the so called Alexandrian text, which King James only has roll off their mouth as if that meant they knew something, that's all Eastern. Alexandria, Egypt was part of the Byzantine Empire for most of the time. Okay? It wasn't until long after the Crusades that, that there was really any particular freedom of the Latins to go there. I mean, Jerome managed to get in there in the 400s before all this stuff heated up. But he was he had to travel there on his own. It wasn't like they had a setup. Okay, in the 200s it, they, they did have a setup. In the 400s they didn't. And after that they didn't because after there was the split between Latin and Greek, the Greeks held the territory. So there's no such thing. There's no such thing as an Alexandrian text. I don't even know why people use the term. But then why do they say Good Friday when he died on Wednesday? And the Bible flat tells you that. Three days and three nights in the grave. Matthew 12, verses 40 and 41. Can't miss it. Alright, so this civil war is seven to what will end up being this civil war before this text. Now let's look at what the text says. We looked at what the text said here. Oh, he's coming in the clouds to save us. This is Deus Ex Machina. Yeah, that's Constantine 7. That's what they're going to say to cover up their civil war. And who won? With his wife Helena behind the scenes. And she's the daughter of this guy who she don't want ruling anymore. Because that way she can't be empress until he's ruling. That's what we saw this was. Big exaggeration, right? Okay, but when we get down here, 1113, okay, now we have this clause, and it doesn't 7. See, it's not 21. See, this was a 21. This, I, I, part of me wants to say that my count is wrong, maybe. 
But, see, because if this was 21, this would be 1134 and it would 7 all by itself. But I was looking at all these words and the variance and I can't find a way to make this increase one. Maybe I'll find one. But unless it increases one, then it's on purpose that it doesn't mean to. This is 20, not 21. If it were 21, that would be 11.34. And with 7 to this, all by itself. But it's not. Why not? Why is it off kilter? Well, maybe it's intentional because look at the text. Let's see. Neither the angels, ude hoi angeloi, and this word isn't in the text. Being. It's, it's just it's stupid. I don't know who inserted that. Okay. Udoi hoi angeloi en in uranoi heaven ude neither. See, this is neither nor. Neither the angels. Udoi hoi angeloi en Uranoi in heaven. Ude nor ho huyas. Remember, because Christ is talking in 30 AD, he has not yet risen. He's not using his godness to foreknow the history. The Holy Spirit is feeding to this, this to him as he talks. This is proof that, you know, he's not cheating by using his godness, so yes, he can go to the cross. And now, this is a, an idiom. E may literally means if not. But, it, but in, it ends up meaning but only. Okay? So it's ude hoi anguloi, neither the angels, and uranoi, in heaven, ude hohuyas, nor the sun, a, a, this is really how you should say it, a, e, a, a, me, this is a strong a sound, a, me, a, me, ho, and this one you'll recognize, pater, so it ends up meaning, but only the Father. Now, he's already set up here, but concerning those days, peri da tes gemeras ekainis, ekainis, you have to say this really fast as one syllable, ekainis, a tes horas udais, udais, eis. Udais, uden, oiden. This kind of a sound play there. Concerning the days, the last days, those I don't want to translate this. The, being what hour? Horas means hour. Udais Oiden. Nobody knows. Udais means nobody. Oiden means knows. Okay, so now he's saying neither the angels in heaven nor the sun, but only Aime Ho Pater. Only the Father. Now, since nobody knows, there's no promise being made about when it's going to be, right? There's only a promise made that it's going to be. I'm not telling you when. Surprise. So it's not seventh. Unless I find some way to seven it, that's the only explanation I can come up with for why it isn't seventh. Is that nobody knows and it's not a promise. Because all these things end up being promises. Okay? A promise is a kind of contract. God is telling you something he's 
promising that it's true. He's promising it'll happen, good or bad. But there's no promise here. There's a promise it's going to happen, but there's not a promise as to when. You cannot set the date of the rapture. Okay, so that's what makes this kind of a spunky thing. The only way it's sevens is if I go back to the prior clause and I leave this out, which I can do if I'm already including the count here. You see the point? He's coming in the clouds all right. And look at how this matches up so beautifully. Yeah, but then they will see him coming in the clouds. And it's satire on the Romulus thing, Romanus thing. But it's also real second advent. Because coming in the clouds is second advent. That's not rapture. Okay, so now he pairs it up with the rapture, which isn't seven because it can happen any time. But concerning the day or hour when that coming in the clouds is going to occur, nobody knows but the Father. Isn't this clever? So one of the things that you find out about this is, oh, when they're bookmarking, when he's using hojuyas here, he's being very precise where to put it. And he's being very precise that it links to the prior reference, the prior use of it, to make a joint statement. See, this statement says, and then they will see him coming in the clouds. That's second advent. And so the, as it were, antiphonal reply is, but when is that going to happen? Because that was the clause here. But concerning those days, nobody knows the hour. Neither the angels in heaven nor the sun, but only dad. All right, so the day that he's going to come, the time when he actually, the real guy, comes, second advent is not knowable. Because only the Father knows it. And the reason why the second advent is not knowable is because the rapture is not knowable. Once the rapture happens, then the second advent will, ha will be known. But not now when Christ talks. Because Daddy has to say, okay, it's time for the rapture. And that's Revelation 4.1, door open, door close. And John represents church, and he goes up to heaven then. So it's like all of church is represented by John going up to heaven then. And then the tribulation starts. Now they all knew that. But he's reiterating it here. And that might be why this is 20 instead of 21. Okay. Now I might reverse myself if I find some compelling reason. But right now this is where it stands. If you see something else, let me know. Now here's the last thing I wanted to cover on this. As I started to say... If you look at Koryas, and you just need to look here at these this menu item. Each page has this, this little set of introduct links, so you can click on them and navigate around the document easily. Koryas is starting in verse 20 and ending in verse 35. So just as a little refresher, because we've covered a lot of ground in this, I apologize. This one. Here's verse 20. What does it say? And... All those days, if the Lord hadn't cut all those days short, nobody would have survived. Okay? Kai, A may, see it's the same construction, but for, but only. Here we'd have to translate it, but for. Cutting short, and then the person doing the cutting is listed next to sort of stress. This is a Hebraistic way of doing things to list the verb first and the subject second. And but for him cutting short. Who's him? The Lord. Those days, there's no Akinas in there. Okay. The is acting like the demonstrative pronoun. There wouldn't be Uk means not, on means if, but it's another idiom. There wouldn't be. If it were true, there wouldn't be. If he hadn't cut the day short, there wouldn't be. Esoste, that comes from sozo, that means to save. 
Now you can save money, you can save your life, you can be saved from an accident, or you can be saved to heaven. There are a lot of different saves in the Bible. You have to figure out which one. He's now talking about physical life. No flesh. Sarx means flesh. There would not be saved any flesh. We'd say, it, it literally says all, but in English when it says not all, that means something different, and he's saying not at all. Not any flesh would be saved if he didn't cut short the days. See, look. And if not him cut short the Lord doing the cutting, the days not um, in that case would be a good English translation would be saved any we'd have to translate that as any flesh or you could translate it not in that case would be saved all flesh not at all kind of goofball flesh so if he had not cut short those days, nobody would be saved. And it's talking about saved from the destruction. Not necessarily saved to heaven. Okay? So that is the beginning of the Koryas phrase at 20. Now we're going to do what we just did with Huyas and go down to the end and see if it talks back to verse 20. And what do you know? What does it say? Well, see, if you knew that the Lord is cutting the sh short the day so that you'd be saved, your first thought is, Oh, well then, what? What, what? Be alert, Gregori de. Un, therefore, uk nat oidete means be on the alert, therefore, and you got, the, he, he's talking like dramatically, so you're not going to insert because. Be on the alert, therefore. You don't know. Ukoidate. They've got it in reverse order. We say don't know. Well, that'll work. You don't know. Therefore, when the Lord to of the house, house of body of Christ will come. So it's Gregory de un uk oidate gar pote hokuyos and it's three syllables here tes oikias ergete when he's gonna come. And they say they got ergete but no ergete I just don't agree with their pronunciation or their diacritics. You don't stress the last syllable because the last syllable keeps on changing so then you never know what the root verb was. So you stress the root verb. Okay? Erkomai means to come. Everybody says it. Erkomai. Okay, so keep the same stress. Erkete. Then everybody knows what kind of verb it is. Otherwise you're going to you say Erkete. Huh? Erketai, really, you should say a i i. Erketai, erketai. It sounds like a second word. No, erkete, erketai. That would be better. You don't know when the Lord's gonna come, so be on the alert. Why be on the alert? What do you mean about the Lord coming? Well, go back here to the prior bookmark in verse twenty. What did I say in verse twenty? Okay, if the Lord didn't cut short those days, everybody would die. Cut short what days? What do you mean cut short? Cut short by how much? Well, if that's the point, dummy, you don't know by how much. So, what do you conclude? You conclude, be alert, therefore, don't, you don't know, therefore, when the Lord of the house, body of Christ, will come. 
Because he's going to cut the short the days, and you don't know when he's going to cut them short. And there's a two meaning to the cut short. He's going to cut it short so the rapture starts, and nobody knows when that's going to happen. And at the end, he's going to cut it short to exactly seven years, just like predicted in Daniel 12, where you do know exactly what day it is and how long. But he's still going to have to cut it short to the seven years, because if he doesn't do that, everybody dies. In other words, some ding-dongs are going to be fighting during the tribulation. They're going to come up with some massive nuclear weapon thingy. And he's going to stop everything before they manage to, to shoot it off. Okay? But you know exactly how long it lasts. And it's a full 7, 365.25 days times 7 years. Daniel maps out the exact number of days in Daniel 12. That's the number of days for the tribulation. And it's split in two parts. Go see my revplay.htm if you want to see how. Okay? It's really obvious. There's a 45-day exit window when they go to install that stupid statue in the middle of the tribulation. You know, in Revelation 13. You're going to get an exit window. Alright? So, you are supposed to hear... The, the Koryas is telling you, your master is saying, be on the alert because you don't know when he's coming. Yeah, and when he comes, he's coming to what? Cut short the days. He's going to cut short the days in the sense of church because that's when church ends. And if church went on one more day, nobody would survive that either. Because people won't believe. It's already starting. Any moment is like that right now. Okay, so be on the alert. And besides, your own days might be cut short because you could die today. What do you want to be able to say to yourself? Forget being a good boy or girl. What is a waste of your time? If you were to die today, what would you consider to be a waste of your time? Because your days could be shut, cut short today. So can mine. One of the reasons I'm doing so many videos is I, I just, I always feel like I'm going to die today. And I want to be able to say, okay, well at least I got that done. Okay, when you look at your life, what do you feel is a waste of your life? Now there's certain things that seem to be waste but aren't. Usually the things you don't like you'll call waste. Differentiate between true waste and the things you call waste because you don't like them. And a lot of things we don't like really are true waste too. And say to yourself, if I were to die today, what would I consider to be a waste of my life? And then talk to God about how to get rid of that waste in case you live tomorrow so you don't have to repeat it again. And then just every single day ask the same question because each day is your last day. That's Hebrews 4. The day ends, it's dead. That's a famous concept in Judaism, too. The day's over. The day dies. Today dies. So, what about tomorrow? If I get through this day, what will I be happy about that I got through on this day? And what would I consider a waste? Because your sarks, your flesh, could be cut off today. And if you get to the end of the day and you say, oh, I forgot that. Okay, resolve to remember it tomorrow. You know, it's like piano practice. You get it wrong mostly. And every once in a while you get the notes right. So you try to do it again for the joy of getting them right, at least sometimes. Okay? So, what is a waste in your life? Ask God how to find a way to stop doing it. Because... He says, and you can even quote him on this, you can go to him and say, Hey, God, you told me to be alert. Because I don't know when you're coming. So what in my life is a waste versus what I merely don't like? Because maybe I don't like it and it's also a waste. And maybe I don't like it and it's really not a waste. And how do I get rid of the waste in my life? How do I reprioritize my life? Then, you'll have a productive day. Because that's fulfilling the command here. Be alert. You don't know when he's coming. You don't know when he's coming for you personally because you die. You don't know when he's coming for the rapture. 
and you don't know in this particular case what was so pregnant about using this here is the Lord comes to you through the Word of God and this was the time when Bible was more popular than ever this was a heyday of popularity of the Bible in Europe everybody had one everybody wanted to get one they had little tiny Bibles and it was the first time that they had Bibles that looked like the Bibles we got now so the Lord came to them through it and you don't know what day or hour that's going to happen because maybe God will suddenly give you three hundred and fifty dollars to buy Bible works in those days that little tiny Bible that they could get their hands on was the equivalent of having Bible works it had little study aids in it it had little commentaries in it it had an index of how to translate the Hebrew names it was great everybody loved it because they believed Daniel 12 said the world was going to end in 1260 AD and this is 1256 see you don't know when the world's going to end that's exactly what they were thinking at the time this is written and by the time the clause ends do you see how witty this is so do you see the application to your life I'm beginning to see it to mine, so I'm going to sign off now, and I'm going to get real serious with God, okay?